Welcome to Defenders of Craft, a Craft Pride podcast, bringing you the heart and soul of beer culture in Austin and around Texas. <laughs> so this is Defenders of Craft, episode six. Uh, we're just getting started with this, so we really thank you guys for making some time out of your busy day to come and sit down with us and talk to us for a little bit. Good to be here. Um, yeah, good to be here, sure. Yeah, it's a beautiful day, and I think that... Uh, it was a great drive, actually. So it was nice to come and see the Texas Hill Country. Uh, you forget how Texas it can be right outside of Austin. It's a comfortable drive. You can put it on cruise control. And yeah. Yeah, I actually relax a little bit and enjoy the scenery instead of being all stop and go the whole time. I did enjoy it. Yeah, there was a lot less traffic between, you know, Austin and Blanco than, uh, you know, just in Austin in right. general. It's nice. <laughs> It's weird sometimes. Yeah, you forget when you're that in cars the, can know, actually move faster than 20 miles, miles per hour. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I drive 33 miles each way each day, uh, and it takes me 35 minutes. So that's not that bad. <laughs> no, not yeah, bad. I drive 45 minutes to get uh, from Cedar yeah, Park to yeah. downtown, <laughs> and so it's pretty horrible. Minutes, but now 50 miles each way. Wow. So yeah. It's not well, that's all. dedication right there. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a nice drive. You can listen to podcasts on it. So that's what yeah. I do. You know, you download things, you listen to them, and it's easy. Well, well, there you go. Learn a little, use that time wisely. So one of the reasons we decided to come out here was uh, we're doing the Swifty release at uh, Craft Ride on the 19th. And uh, we had an opportunity, they said, to sit down and talk with you, Tim. And I was pretty excited about that. Uh, you're a real OG in the craft beer scene. So... Uh, it's cool, and I'm honored to sit down and talk with you for a little bit. How did you get your start in the craft beer industry? Like, what was, like, your, your entry into Texas craft beer? Um, well, like a lot of the early people in this industry, I was, I was a home brewer in college. Um, I actually um, got my first professional brew at Waterloo Brewing Company with uh, Steve Anderson and Doug Hagedorn. Um, I won a competition for this kind of a uh, hopped up American brown ale uh, from, you know, local Austin uh, zealots, nice. um, which are still going strong, by the way, uh, the local com- uh, homebrew club. Um, so, yeah, I got first place in this thing, and, and the prize was brewing your recipe at Waterloo. So, um, yeah, that was back in 94. Wow. <laughs> yeah, probably summer of 94. Um, and then a few months later, uh, I got an assistant brewer job at the Bitter End, and I was there for 10 years. Took yeah. over as head brewer right away. It was like less than four months I took over as head brewer there. So That's pretty awesome. So, like, at the Bitter End, you kind of, like, helped shape what Austin beer became because that's, like, kind of one of the central places where folks could get good, tasty beers. Yeah, it started out a little rough. Uh, you know, they – had some funky uh, equipment there um, when I when I got there there was some infected beer uh, some of the customers would come in and ask what was good on tap that day and that was what I was trying to turn around <laughs> when I first got there was just fighting kind of funky beer and wanting to make sure that um, you know Bitterin had a reputation as really good beer not just that good all food of them should be good in, in, on any given yeah, day yeah you come in this you should look at what style week. you yeah. want to drink not what's the best tap <laughs> not which one is actually <laughs> drinkable <laughs> just this hour you know it's like ah so so yeah but we were you know they already had good reputation for food I just wanted to bring the beer up to that same quality and we ended up doing that we you know over the years uh, won several medals at Great American Beer Festival we uh you know, we were one of the early kind of people getting into sour beer production. I mean, we were doing... On a, purpose? Yeah, Lambic style. <laughs> uh, yeah, on purpose. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, so many infected beers, you know. Yeah. So we, yeah, we had, had some barrels on the B side, and, um, you know, that originally just doing some whiskey barrel stuff, but then wanting to go full on into some sour production, which we ended up winning... Uh, Couple medals in the early 90s. Uh, I mean, I mean, the early 2000s uh, for uh, Belgian style sours. Um, one was called Sour Prick. It was prickly pear <laughs> sour, uh, hand picked tunas out in Seguin. Like, would, would you say that that's like gone on to have any effect on your barrel program now here? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, because um, I, I want to say like the barrel aged sours y'all do are absolutely fantastic. So. Yeah, so, you know, as far as the barrel program, we went 
several years without having one, but we were just waiting to get enough room and some time to start putting the efforts into that. And and so, you know, at this point, we've been doing it for seven, eight years. Um, and, you know, Eric uh, Ogershock had a lot to do with the barrel program, um, and he was uh, originally our, the we called him the Woodmaster General. Uh, that was his. That was <laughs> yeah. one of his titles. So. Rightfully so, as far as um, I can tell. But yeah, I mean, both of us had a pretty big passion for uh, sour beer, wild ales, all of that stuff, and you know, so I think that was a combination. So we have Eric sitting down here with us. How does it feel to to replace an Eric? Well, I, I got a nickname from it, so I guess that's good. I'm E2 or Deuce. <laughs> <laughs> The ego had something to do with that, too, as well. But it turned out to be a better nickname than I probably would have gotten had I screwed something up and gotten one the old-fashioned way. Uh, it's, I've enjoyed it here. I came on here to Real Ale probably about 2009 as a guy, honestly, that had taken way too many tours, probably had way too many beers, and got you know a little too eager to talk to Tim one day and said, hey, can I come in and help you out? And then he called me back a few months later and said, yeah, come on in. And I volunteered for a couple years here and that's kind of how I got my break nice from a desk job and into somewhat of a professional brewing he was game. very persistent and and then he was willing to come out every Friday and like work so I was like cool <laughs> <laughs> so you were a home brewer already I was a home brewer and, and I, was, I started home brewing I was in Austin went to UT and uh, started home brewing about 97 while I was in school there Bitter End used to be my wife and I's joint when we were dating. That's where we'd go to eat, you know, have a nice dinner and drink some good beer. So that and Waterloo and all the all the places that started around the late, you know, that were functioning at the late 90s, early 2000s. That's kind of where I cut my teeth in the Austin beer scene. Had drank a lot of beers at the Old Gingerman before it moved locations and things like that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it worked out. I was a after school, I went on became a lab rat for a few years and was doing the laboratory thing as a microbiologist and always had an interest in brewing but not until I came out here and was able to be volunteered I really understand that that was a you know a real career I could have for me I, I just didn't really have that wow I could use all this time I spent in school towards something I actually fully enjoy and I'm super into and once that light turned on and it clicked I, I was good to go so I had no problem coming out here and helping volunteer that was the best times ever and they made it fun it was a lot of you know, sloppy, dirty grunt work like most brewing mm -hmm. is, but it was just a blast to hang out in the culture out here is what probably sold me more than anything else. So it treated me like family from day one, and you don't find a lot of places like that, quite honestly, outside of the brewing industry. Yeah, that's pretty awesome to see how uh, people can come together when there's not a huge industry already uh, and make careers out of it, you know, because you started way back when, and now, you know, obviously Real Ale is one of the largest breweries in the state, um, one of the only breweries that has the, the reach that it does in the state uh, to get to all the different areas. So that's pretty awesome to see that, uh, you know, somebody who has a dream can make that happen in the Texas brew scene. I also like how awesome. we all basically end up in, in this through some like well yeah this is the place that i like to go drink for a long time and then i knew this guy who knew that guy and that's how i ended up doing this you know that's, i feel like everybody's got that same kind of backstory to how they ended up accidentally in beer or even if on, on purpose it was like i didn't really intend to set out doing this necessarily or this wasn't where i expected i would be but yeah, here brewing. I am. Yeah. <laughs> the the culture just media. just yeah. puts you in a place. And you're like, oh, I guess I'm doing this now. So, <laughs> um, so director of brewing operations, uh, what is all does that entail when it comes to your brewery work here? And like how much beer do you actually brew? Are you more in charge of like recipe creation? Um, so it used to be you know, I was brewing. I, I was, you know, on the hot side. Uh, and on the brew house, but probably about 2012 when we were building the packaging hall here, um, we started, we went to overnights and there was so much other stuff to do project wise that I was not physically on the platform brewing anymore. Uh, so for the past five or six years, I haven't brewed very many batches at all. Like I haven't- uh, Until recently. Yeah. Now that, yeah, so, 
a lot of it's project stuff. I still would have my hand in uh, final approval of recipes, recipe formulation, stuff like that. But we also want um, some of the younger guys to get involved in recipe formulation and you know style research and all this. So you know, we try to spread that around a little bit. I would always have final approval. I still kind of keep that. Um, but yeah, now with the pilot system, we have this little uh, 10 hectoliter pilot system, which is 8.1 barrels. And I got to brew the first couple of batches on that. And uh, I get to jump back in and, and actually physically brew some beer. And that's, uh, that's a lot of fun for me. I'm yeah, really I wish that feels good, like yeah. back oh, yeah. to where you started. Yeah, and, it, and it's cool because I'm back like on the similar size to what I started with at, uh, at a brew pub, you know, at the Bitter End. So it's like, it's kind of like going back to your roots. And uh, yeah, it's very satisfying. I bet. So with your pilot system, who all is going to get a chance to uh, to brew on that? Will it just be uh, seasoned employees, or will everyone get a, a crack at a? So we'd like to let everybody on. come in and have a shot at you know at a brew on this. I mean, the, you'll have to have a brewer working with you, obviously, because I mean you can't just say, "Oh yeah, go brew a batch of beer." Here's some instructions. Uh, here's an SOP. Go do it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that you know more with this small batch, more and more people can get involved. Um, you know, with the when we were doing the Brewers Cut series, they were still 60 barrel batches or more. Um, but we we still tried to get as many people involved as possible. So, you know, like that oyster stout, that was Nate, who's one of our uh, guys out in the market. That was his idea. And, you know, he he's like, oh yeah, come on, let's let's develop this recipe, and you come in and help us brew this thing. You know, so. Um, but but with this little guy, we can open it up to pretty much everybody over time. You know, once once we get things rolling, some more things in. We are did you, that. Are you still doing the brewer's cut? I feel like I haven't had one in a minute. No, uh, we're kind of like just letting that kind of roll yeah. on out. I think uh, embittered brown is out right now, but I think that's probably the the last one that we're putting out. Now we might put out a couple brewer's cut things draft only off the pilot mm -hmm. system, but for the most part, we're just making crazy new stuff on the pilot system and that's kind of the R&D uh, side of it now um, yeah awesome and so all y'all's pilot system beers y'all just sell here in the tap room um, you'll see some limited kegs going out in the market so we're doing you know full TABC approval and everything and, and so there'll be they will be kegs out in the market but it'll be very limited I mean you know, if you're talking about eight barrels and we want to keep enough to supply our tap room I don't know, maybe you'll see yeah. eight or ten kegs yeah. for the whole state of Texas in a particular <laughs> little batch. So it'll be super limited on that. But you will see it out in the wild. So we had a, uh, or we didn't actually get to tap it. it. It got delivered to us by accident, and we didn't tap it because we're good people. Uh, but we uh, had a uh, cherry limeade goza cask that came through our bar, and we didn't get a chance to tap it, and I really regret <laughs> not doing back. that. We gave it back, yeah. Because it wasn't ours. It was for someone else. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, it was really difficult to not tap well, into that. Well, we can make another one. Yeah, yeah let's do that. <laughs> We're, yeah. We'll be on the pilot season here in just a it's, month or so. Yeah, there. I can't wait for Lime Goza. I don't know what you know about our favorite. affinity for Lime Goza, but uh, we rallied every rep that we could and sent emails, and we're so happy that uh, Goza in general is a year-round offering. Uh, but what's it going to take to get Lime Goza year-round? Yeah. It's always <laughs> hot here. I mean, I like hot the here, and, and Texas needs lime. that Lime Goza. Yeah. All, all year long. I, I, I found, like, an extra six-pack or two at my local HEB, like, two or three months after the mm -hmm. season ended, and I bought all of them, and yeah. I still have a couple in my fridge because I'm like – I don't know when I'm going to need this. You know, this is like the special beer that I save, <laughs> even though it's, it's you know, not a special <laughs> beer to most people. <laughs> well, no, it's, I mean, it's been very popular and um, it's, it is a great refreshing summer beer. Um, and the goes in general is, it's good. It's good year round, but it, you know, it, it's definitely, they're all refreshing. I'm looking forward to checking out the cranberry and we're thinking about maybe popping one more type out, but we'll see. Um, but what for are, sure, what we'll are have we cranberry in the fall. The, the other I don't know. We're still playing around. It's not even <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but, like, yeah. This is definitely speaking my language, though. Um, but no, that's cool. It's, a, it's you know, it's a great style. And you know, when we did that for our 18th anniversary, there wasn't any in the market really, and we were all excited. Originally, we brewed that beer with Odell as a little baby small collab for the the Colorado Brewers Guild 
um, they have this little fundraiser thing, and they do collabs from all over the state. We went up there and uh, and brewed a similar beer with those guys. And then uh, it's funny, the 18th anniversary, we were we were going to do a Berliner Weiss, which we're finally doing mm-hmm. this year for our anniversary. Um, and we were about to pull the trigger and brew that beer, and St. Arnold's came out with Boilermaker, and we're like, well, shoot. Well, I'm glad they <laughs> did not, then. Cause we're not gonna, we're that, not gonna I thought that. that blew Boilermaker out of the water at the time, yeah. So, so anyway, we just decided to do something completely different. It's like, hey, let's let's do this Goza with the lime, man. That was really good. So that's that's kind of where that originally came from, and it was so well received that we popped it into a seasonal slot that next year. I feel like that's that's one of the beers that was really influential in just our market in general, as far as really kind of opening people's eyes to the fact that in this kind of heat, as often as we have it, that if you make really drinkable, refreshing, you know, Gosa's, Berliner's, Kettle Sours in general, that it's more or less like printing money, man. We've got a market that would love to drink your product all the time. Well, we'll see how the... And I, I feel like the, the Gosa is, you know, very responsible for that. Like, yeah. it was such a great beer. It really turned so many people on to the the style in general i think in our market it's the only canned beer that i know of in texas that i can't sit down it's a one sip beer i can't sit that beer down i it's i don't know how it happens it's just it's gone <laughs> before i set it down it happens to me too yeah Same thing, yes. so on the new brew house we have a we built it to have a kettle souring loop so that oh, you, nice. know, you don't have to like hook up some extra hoses and get all crazy to try to get the you know the work cooled down the kettle so we actually had it built with a kettle souring loop um and so the first kettle sour that we did is this anniversary beer for our 22nd and it's a it's a berliner weiss called zwei und zwanzig and when are you releasing that uh it'll be released at the party um so saturday the 21st is going to be the first release we're going to have it everybody gets a can if they want one and we'll have a couple little uh, syrups out there too if you want to mix in oh, nice. you know a little woodruff or raspberry um but uh at that point it'll be available in the market the week after so you can go check it out and find it in the stores uh, it's very limited there's only going to be it's less than 2,000 cases for the whole state so you're going to want to get it while you can but um it's really cool artwork and cool looking can and a great beer it's gonna be very refreshing yeah it'll be in that same summer vein yeah you know really nice mm-hmm. crushable i look forward to it uh i berliners and gozes are yeah. some of my favorites <laughs> excited already <laughs> <laughs> but shifting away like to something else that you guys have been uh working on that's kind of new how is the real spirits program going for you guys it's going well we keep it very small um you know davin who's our uh, distiller, he uh, he's the only dude working in that <laughs> place. I mean, he's he's distilling it, um, then he's you know he's racking it into barrels, he's checking the aging it. I mean, Brad's always hanging out with him whenever he can too. Brad's way into the distilling program, and he's he's wanted to have a, a distillery for ever since I got here, uh, 2004, and. So this has been his dream for a long time, but it's it's a one-man operation. It's all hand-bottled, hand-labeled, uh, so it's all sold out of uh, the tap room here. We don't distribute, um, you know, to to liquor stores or anything. Yeah. So, um, but we have like some really cool events. Um, we'll do a single barrel release where you know we pick one barrel and maybe it's special aged in another barrel for a few months or. But it's, it's just one barrel's worth, a couple hundred bottles, and we'll do a special Saturday release every few months. And those things just go. You have to come out here that day or you're not going to get a bottle. That's crazy. I haven't had any of these spirits yet. It's mm-hmm. pretty exciting. You guys are doing just a, a bourbon and a gin, a tequila, I think? It's, a, it's an all-malt whiskey. So we're not doing a bourbon. It's an all-malt whiskey. Um, and it's based on... It's a blend of one of the washes is our uh, devil's backbone, but 100% malt and no hops. And then the second wash that we do for them is uh, based on the real heavy, and it's basically the real heavy recipe without hops. 
Um, both of those beers are in that eight to nine percent range, which is perfect for starting the distilling process. Um, and then, so Dad will make the will make the wash in the brew house. We'll ferment it and then give it to him, and he'll distill and get it into barrels. And then he ultimately uh, picks uh, what the blend of those two different recipes, uh, you know, the percentages and all that, to just get whatever blend he wants. And that's that's the whole art that. I really don't understand, but they're doing a nice job of it. And then we also do a, a gin. It's an all malt gin, and that's based on a strong version of our uh, white beer. So it's a 30% weeded uh, gin, and um, doesn't taste like a London Dry. It's got a lot more complexity, a little more body, because you're you're kind of starting from a white whiskey base rather than a vodka base. But nice. um, it's pretty cool. But still with the juniper. Uh, yeah, it has juniper, all kinds of botanicals, really nice citrus. And then we also use bottle brush in there, which nobody else is using. Hmm. Um, and so that gives it our own little unique twist there. That's pretty interesting. I, I'm a gin man myself, so I would love to try that sometime. Yeah, it's a very all new right. world gin, and I, yeah. I also enjoy gin a lot, and I love our gin. It makes one of the best gin and tonics out there in my opinion. Are we going to see more crossovers in the other direction as well, like, uh, you know, barrel aging your beers in your own in-house alcohol yeah we've already done that um, this year's four horsemen release yeah it was aged in uh real spirits barrels so that was like the first racking of the original blend of whiskey mm -hmm. uh a year or so ago and then we immediately filled those fresh freshly emptied barrels with our uh black quad and and made the first batch of our uh Four horsemen in our barrels. So yeah, we're already doing we're that. Gonna, We've got, got we're some gonna see a lot more of that for sure. Then yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean any barrels Excellent. that they're gonna give to us, we're gonna fill them. And yeah, we'd love using like a commissar one maybe. Uh, <laughs> that is definitely. Ah <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah definitely. Does, I mean does, Imperial does, Stout does, in a yeah. in a whiskey barrel. Yeah, that's gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see you guys expand to tequila and do Goza in a real spirits tequila barrel. Ooh, yeah, yes, nice. well, you know, we did. We do have the, you know, that the El Wapo, which, oh, which, which is in tequila really barrels, nice. but not our tequila. Yeah, barrel. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, yeah, but we've got another round of that coming up. The El Wapo? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. Wasn't that right last now. year's uh, anniversary beer? Um, we had it out at about that time. Around it that wasn't time. officially the anniversary beer. Um, yeah, the anniversary last year was the that kegger lager. Oh, the keg party. Like, yeah, it was keg like, party yeah. lager. Yeah, yeah it was a, just like <laughs> super slamming. Oh, yeah, that was super crushable. I was lager. here. Yeah. I've been to the last five, I think, anniversary parties. I, I love coming out here. It's my favorite part of the year. It's like right around my birthday. Like So it's always like my birthday thing is like to come out here and, and really have a good time. Uh, so you guys just did a, uh, a huge beer, a brewery expansion. Um, and how long has that been in the works at this point? Well, we were planning it for several years. Um, you know, they're just working with trying to pick out who is going to build your brew house and who's going to be the main supplier for your brew house. Um, and then we had a whole year of planning with architects and, you know, trying to design the building. And then last March, we broke ground, and uh, it took about a year, you know, to get the building finished. We're, we're done now, which is great. Uh, so, you know, when we actually started the project, it went fairly fast. That, that building over there did not exist until, you know, I mean, it wasn't even started until March 1st of last year. And That's by crazy. December 15th, we were brewing on the brew house. Uh, the building was still getting finished, you know, until late January, mid Feb, but um, but the brew house we, we've been brewing on it since middle of December. The uh, the old uh, original brew house is out in the field now. So <laughs> out to the pasture. There, there's no going back. Man. <laughs> yeah, it's it's gonna hopefully retire in Florida. I see. Yeah, I mean, because someone can use it, even oh, if yeah. it, if you can't use it, someone yeah. can use that. Uh, how much beer are you gonna be able to crank out of there? Well, uh, it depends on how much beer the Texas beer drinkers want to go drink. Uh, it would actually, I mean, from if we went round the clock on that thing, it can do 10 brews a day, and it's 120-barrel uh, brew length. Whew. So, I mean, it could do a quarter million barrels, um, but that's not 
that's not the reason we bought it. I mean, right. you know, it's we're we always have been growing organically and just in the state of Texas. So we didn't buy this brew house to just like quadruple production. We bought it because uh, we wanted to increase our quality, increase consistency. Uh, we were already brewing from early, early Monday morning all the way into Friday around the clock on the uh, 60 barrel. And so we were running uh, three shift brew and cellar um, all week long. And that's just hard on people, you know? So we- I could imagine. We basically, um, you know, made an investment for quality of life of our employees and we went back to two shifts and, and um, you know, it's like, there's just a whole lot of advantages of this. Plus, it also looks really cool. <laughs> <laughs> we can't forget that. Um, so that's not going to affect because you're not trying to brew necessarily more beer. You're just trying to make it easier to brew larger batches so that your staff doesn't have to work 24 hours a day. Yeah, and, you know, whatever the natural growth is, that's cool. And obviously we don't, we'd like to brew a little more beer. So, you know, you guys, everybody listening, go out and buy Real Ill and go drink a bunch of it and we'll brew more. <laughs> but, uh, but, no, we're not trying to take over the world. And, you know, we're, we're in Texas. We're planning on staying in Texas. Right. Which is awesome, and it's cool to see um, how businesses that have a narrow focus, like Just Texas, uh, can succeed, because that's obviously our beer model. Uh, we don't like to mess with any beers outside of Texas. We're working on programs to get beers that are made outside of Texas to where we won't sell any of them, even in bottles, just because it makes sense to double down on your concept. And it's cool to hear that even with a brewery expansion that could push you into other states, uh, it's just to keep the quality and control and everything running well just for Texas. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, especially because, like, I mean, our closest neighbors are what, Louisiana and Oklahoma? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, they need our beer. New Mexico actually has a pretty good beer scene right yeah, now. Yeah, but, I mean, you got a state where you can drink 24 hours a day or, like, you know, out on the street even. Y'all ought to have better beer. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I'm not going there. I'm not casting shade. <laughs> <laughs> well, as somebody that has worked at a all Texas beer bar for five years now, I think I can, you know, uh, very Cast proudly talk, yeah. uh, you know, whatever sort of shade I want to about <laughs> our let, neighbors let, versus yeah. our own state's beer. I'll let the beer do the talking. <laughs> yeah, it does, I will. I think. It does. No, the cool thing about the new brew house, I think, from our standpoint, is as physical brewers in there every day is the consistency. It's it, you can manipulate so many small components of the brew all the way through, and it is spot on within tenths of a degree at every you know critical point. It, it's it's amazing in that yeah. sense. Just this week, and and it's fast. It's it's wicked fast. Uh, we've brewed through this week. We'll brew as much beer just doing a normal kind of a 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. kind of double shift brew day, four days a week, as we could have done around the clock five days a week. That's back awesome. Back in the old brew house. And That's it's, awesome. you know, and the point that Tim speaks about is the quality of life. It's great, you know. There's no one here in the middle of the night, you know, from a safety standpoint. That's great. You know, everyone mm -hmm. gets to go home and, you know, see their family or their, you know, or their loved ones or their cats or their dogs or whatever it is, you know. And from a safety standpoint, that's also and, great. And that's great, <laughs> too. You know, everybody has a just it's it's just a better feeling. Yeah. You know, in that sense, everyone's much happier when they're coming in. And, and we do a better job when we got big fat smiles on our faces and, you know, get to go home at night. It's cool. Yeah, yeah and I it worked looks in the video really game cool. industry once. <laughs> <laughs> it looks cool because we shine the bejesus out of that thing. <laughs> and the polishing. control room's air conditioned. Yeah. That's nice. Oh, yeah. nice. AC. That's what real that? nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's like almost yeah. unheard of in a brew the, house. The brew AC? house isn't, but the, the control room The control is. room where you spend a lot Fair of your time, time is... Yeah, well the, the old system you were running up and down the stairs, it was all manual valves and manual pumps on and on, everything. So you're running up and down the stairs, and in the summer it could be 115 degrees on the platform. It, it got pretty hot up there. Now you had a big fan, and there's ventilation, but um, this is this is automated. It's you know you you do a lot from the computer station, but you know you're still adding hops. You're you're running up and down uh, between the two levels, but not the same amount. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we've noticed as a trend that's kind of been happening lately is that everybody's kind of gravitating back towards 
uh, lager styles, uh, easy drinking, original German lager styles. Um, you guys got anything lined up for the core in that? Maybe moving the Hellas into the core? Or how do you feel about that? I mean, I think that was one of the reasons we put Hans out, you know, a long time ago. Is I know that it's a little more hoppy than what you would consider a session lager, but, you know, we wanted something that was, um, you know, a, a pretty tight lager that, you know, was German style and drinkable. Um, but we also wanted it to be like a little more intense. And so, you know, we were going for that kind of North German Yaver, a little more bitter, more intense, hoppy pills. And of course, then we had to put a little more, a little more hops in there than even that. So um, that's, you know, we've been playing in that uh, arena for a long time. And yeah, we're, I mean, the Hellas, um, it's, this year's Hellas is like so on point uh, because we're brewing it on the German brew house and it's just like even tighter than it was last year. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're pretty happy with that. I mean, I could see that or something similar moving into, you know, a full time slot. We just got to kind of look at that. Maybe, you know, we're at least considering that as a possibility or something, you know, some type of lager that's very crushable. Yeah. Yep. I can see something happening there. That sounds good. I love the uh, Hellas style, and I'm glad that it's kind of seen a resurgence. Mm -hmm. um, I think you guys are one of the first ones that put out a Hellas that picked up any traction uh, recently in the last couple of years. So that's pretty cool to see that you guys are already ahead of the curve on that one. Um, so Axis started out as draft only, and now we see 12 packs of Axis, which are awesome, and thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> is uh, if Swifty does well, is it you know going to take the same route that Axis did and maybe move into the package side? I think it's a little early to go down that path. I mean, I never say never, but I don't think I would be speculating on that. I mean, we just released it last week, so I think you know. But it's awesome, and I I'd love to see it in package. Yeah. But um, and it's got real nice branding too. It does. I, uh, I had it next uh, side by side to another local brewery who just released a, a hoppy pale ale. Um, and I got to say, Swifty wins. Uh, it's fantastic. I haven't had a, uh, a traditional pale ale like that that's light and easy and still has all the flavor that you're looking for yeah. uh, without being heavy. And it's real good. Well, that's one thing. I mean, you can see how pale this beer is. I mean, there's... There is some caramel malt in there, but it's a very small percentage, and it's very light-colored caramel malt, so you don't get into that kind of nutty, uh, darker caramel kind of flavor. This is very pale. It's just real bright, and it's, you know, it's just to emphasize the hops and and just be tropical, citrusy, and refreshing. I mean, that's that's the whole point. So yeah, I'm digging it. I'm, you know, I love hoppy pale ales, and I like I like bright and hoppy IPAs. It's just the IPAs are up at 7%, you know, and this yeah. one's right at 5 So, you know, if I'm sitting there and I'm going to have two or three of these bad boys, it's like I don't get completely buzzed. Uh, on three, yeah. You know, on right. three, yeah. So I'm not calling it a session beer, but it is a drinkable, you know, mid-alcohol beer. So Yeah, that um, sounds like a session beer to me. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't, doesn't have to be a Berliner to be in sessionable right. territory to me. <laughs> Uh, so all the way out here in Blanco, uh, do you guys have a good reception with the local community in town? Do you see a lot of those folks who come out for your tap room hours? Yeah, I mean, we have locals who show up. Um, you know, we're not open very late. We're not trying to compete with the local establishments. So, you know, we close. Uh, the latest we stay open is 7. Um, so, but, yeah, I mean, we get we have regulars coming in here. We get people from all over the state and all over the country as well. But it's not like we're in downtown Austin or downtown Houston. Uh, so, I mean, we're not going to have, you know, be completely packed all the time. But, um, but it, it's, a, it's a pleasant feel, and we get nice business on Friday and Saturday. And there's Hill Country Tourism on Sundays, too. You know, we're open Wednesday through Sunday now because we actually found out that Sunday was more busy than Wednesday, Thursday, you know, because you got all the wineries. And, mm -hmm. and this yeah. is like winery, brewery, distilling mecca out here. I mean, it's all the way 
Fredericksburg all the way through like my neighborhood on Fitzhugh Road uh, into Austin. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you sure. can throw a rock and hit another place. You can touch twenty places. You know, in a, in a twenty-minute circle. Easy. Yeah. Yeah, we always end up with that problem of people like asking about going out to visit Jester King and then, you know, it's difficult not to be like, well, also Last Stands out there mm-hmm. and so Argus and places you can dip into. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't yeah. have to be a one destination well, thing. Yeah, you got, you know, you got Argus, Revolution Spirits and Last Stand in the same complex. Yeah. Now, you yeah. don't even have to leave the parking lot. <laughs> and like, whoa. Yeah. And I mean, there's what, like four distilleries in Dripping Springs. There's yeah. Like I right mean, we drove past deep eddy to get out here there's dripping yeah. springs for sure yeah i mean it's it's crazy i actually live just north of uh Fitzy road on 12 mm-hmm. it's like that's that's kind of my hood nice do you guys get a lot of folks out from austin at all oh yeah yeah we do mm-hmm. yeah i mean that's i we've always considered austin our home market austin was our first market i mean you don't start a brewery in Blanco thinking that Blanco is your yeah. home market. I mean, we love the people in Blanco, but there's 1,500 of them, you know? It's yeah. like, how much beer are you going to sell in Blanco? So, you no, know, we've always considered ourselves, you know, to, to be Austin as our home mar- city, you know? And most of us came from Austin. I mean, I've graduated from UT. I've been in Austin since the early 80s, you know? Like I came from Austin. Full Moon was the first, uh, the first beer I, would, you know, tried to brew as a home brewer commercial collect you know thing and mm-hmm. nice. that's how it went down you know that's what drew me into craft in a lot of ways in texas was this place I mean, uh, definitely um I mean, you know you i'm go, you go i'm in my there. early 30s yeah but like uh when i started drinking and when i came of age in austin i i was drinking firemen's and live oak beers and stuff mm-hmm. and it was like I didn't realize that there was a difference at the time between that and anything else. Like I didn't realize that Fireman's wasn't a nationally available brand or anything, you you know? And, you know, I I really got to thank you guys for getting me hooked real early on the good stuff because, you know, I didn't know at the time that there was a difference until I was already knee deep in it, you know? It's like, I, I, I really credit Live Oak and Real Ale for you know, the majority of my, like, craft beer experience is a, a young drinker at the time. Wow. So, like, yeah, I wouldn't be here talking about it now. We all have similar experiences. <laughs> I can talk about the same two breweries for me, too. So. <laughs> so have you guys ever considered doing a, uh, like, a campout style event out here, a festival or anything like that? It's such a scenic and beautiful area out here. It seems like it would lend itself well. So right now we're kind of working on getting – the grounds kind of beautified and fixed up and and ready to go um, and yeah I mean we've considered we have a really cool little natural amphitheater going down the hill here and we've considered putting on a stage down there uh, we've talked about maybe having uh, you know like movie night you get yeah movie night does well for us we just started movie night as well cool. yeah and you know so we could get Maybe work with draft, Alamo Draft House or something. Have a big old screen out here or something, or who knows? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we've talked about events like that. Uh, we haven't talked about a multiple day music v- event, but maybe we need to. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're actually we're over 25 acres out here now. Uh, yeah, but you got the room. But part of it's our uh, wastewater pre-treatment plant, so we probably wouldn't be camping out real close. <laughs> 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 but no, there's a lot of beautiful hill country. I mean, we we have a lot of nice uh, oak trees and cedar out here, and yeah, we can we could consider that. Nice. Well, let me know, because I will definitely come. Well, and there's Blanco State Park right down the road, I which know. is a dope yeah. place to camp, you know, especially if you're coming out for the anniversary party. Mm-hmm. If you can, if you're smart enough and you book early enough, you can catch a spot there. Just a short little bike ride if you're into that kind of thing up here, nice and safe. Head back and camp there overnight. Yeah, that's, that's a good dude. pro tip. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it always fills up so quick. Yeah, easy. it fills up so <laughs> quick, yeah, though. It's hard. you got to be on your game. Yeah, even just Thinking to reserve a tent ahead. campground, yeah. yeah. you got to, like, really be ahead of the game on that one. Um, yeah, I'm, like, tempted to bust my phone out and start, yeah, like, searching that <laughs> stuff right now. Like, oh, it's oh this hasn't gone out. Late. This isn't live. Yeah. Nobody will know. It's definitely too late, man. I'm telling you now. Um, There's part of Falls, not just the other, just the other way. That one fills up too. All of them, they all yeah. fill up because mm-hmm. everybody wants to come out here and not have to drive all the way back to Austin. Uh, it's just one of those things, you know. 
people know and so many people you guys beer has such a huge right. reach that when you throw a birthday party everyone's like well i guess we're going let's get the yeah. get the trailer let's go pray for no not rain. not one of those like one-year-old fledgling breweries that i'm like oh yeah man i love this this brewery because they've made six beers and they're all great you know it's like <laughs> you know more power to them but when you've got over 20 years of just solid beer experience you know that's that's a big shadow that's so casting one year old breweries could be dangerous to go to too though <laughs> fair enough yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll be pulling out some cool things from the cellar for the anniversary party. We always do. You know, we always bring out some special age stuff. We bring out some M- a lot of MV. Um, so I don't even know what all we're popping out of here, but it's always, you know, just tapping new stuff every hour. And who knows what we'll show up with. Well, Carrie knows, but she's yeah. not talking. Let's hope for <laughs> Let's hope for the beer list. Yeah. <laughs> let's hope for knocking. Knocking is like one of my absolute <laughs> favorites. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm excited about anything y'all are going to pull out for that kind of thing because we just had our big five-year anniversary, and, you know, having multiple vintages of Scott's Gone Wild on was one of the highlights to me. Having cool. Benedictum, 14, 15, and 17 Scott's, that, that's, that's yeah, not right. That's yeah, about, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Scott's card. ages really well. <laughs> it's it's just, it's yeah. Good, yeah. I mean, like, and we're just a bar. I can imagine what you guys are going to pull out for this. Yeah. You know? Well, plus we're debuting our uh, new pilot system beers. So we have we have two uh, special batches that we brewed for you know small release. And uh, you want to talk about those? We can talk about them a little bit. We're we yeah. going to go. <laughs> we got the green light. Yeah, green yeah, light. We're waiting on that green light. Uh, yeah, I got a couple fun things. Uh, we did a batch of dry stout. That, are we going to have that one available? We'll have that, that on okay. nitrogen, yeah. So there'll be a, a nitro dry stout, truly nice and sessionable, about 4.5% ABV. Nice. Super classic in that sense, you know, nice and That's roasty, actually going to be year-round. We're going to be drink. putting that oh, out nice. on draft. So you'll see that in other areas, as Tim said, yeah. coming up pretty soon. So you guys are finally moving into nitro, right? Just on a small basis. Just have mm-hmm. something available. And, you know, dry stout is classic. That'd be like the first beer you've ever done on Nitro, uh-huh. because as right. far as I know, previously Eric was staunchly opposed to putting beers but on you Nitro. You know, Eric, he was this a little a different bit Eric, of a, though. <laughs> <laughs> he was a little bit. What is it? Uh, uh, he was metal. That's uh, what he was. Yeah, very metal. <laughs> very metal. Very opinionated. Great guy. Uh, but yeah, sometimes he's just like. No, we can't do a cask of Hans because it's a German style lager. I'm like, no, you can do a cask of Hans. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun, man. Come on. So yeah, sometimes he's a little rigid on that stuff. But yeah, dry stout on nitro. Why the hell? That makes sense. Um, yeah. I'm I'm definitely looking forward to a good solid dry stout from y'all then because the the dry stout offerings in our market are fairly few and far between. And you know, if you don't like one or two, and there's only one or two. Mm-hmm. What do you? What have you got? You know. Toss your hands in the air. Yeah, like it's well, like, well, I guess I'm drinking an imperial, man. Temptress, here I come. Go big. <laughs> no, that's it. We got we've got that going. And there are a couple of new things we're trying out. We've got one called pineapple nunchucks. So we're just doing a little hokey, goofy, crazy stuff, and uh, the reins have been kind of cut loose on us, which is fun. So this is a, uh, it's a saison with pineapple, Korean chilies, and ginger. So. Huh. Just playing with the yeah. fruit thing a little bit, right. and some yeah. other ingredients that we've done in the past, and some other beers, and just yeah. kind of seeing how it how it shakes out. But it's awesome. It's nice and dry and spicy. Man, it attenuated all the way down. It's six. It's right at six percent alcohol, so it's not like a huge saison. It's right there in the classic like six yeah. percent range, and uh, but it, it dried out. I mean, it's down below one point oh. Oh, easy. Uh, is it going to be similar to the Soul Crusher? I remember Soul Crusher no, was we like tried not that same to, thing. Yeah, I mean, there was a couple things. I mean, Soul Crusher had ginger, and we really liked the Korean chili that was in there, but it was too subtle, so we bumped it up on this smaller batch, nice. especially to play against the pineapple. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, a couple of the ingredients are the same, but it isn't based on that at all. The fresh recipe. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And the pineapple sounds like it's just meant to be with those other ingredients. That mm-hmm. sounds like it's going to be really good. Yep. I can't wait. Fun. Yeah. And then one of our other brewers, he had a homebrewed beer that he had done a long time ago that he liked a double wit with hibiscus. So we kind of rolled up a bigger version of that. We're calling it Yoga Pants. It's <laughs> <laughs> got some flake barley in there for some mouthfeel. It's, uh, it's a nice beer. We're coming in about 6.5% ABV or so. Nice it's got a little agave nectar in there, too. A little agave nectar, too, to boost mm, it up. Sounds good. Yeah. 
has like a pinch of pumpkin spice. It. <laughs> but it's cool. It's actually out of the three, it's probably my favorite, and it was the one that I would probably least gravitate to based on looking at a recipe. But after I've had all of them, I thought it's extremely, extremely crushable. Yeah. Very awesome. easy drinking and refreshing. It's a, it's a dope beer. So we'll start throwing out some fun stuff like that. That sounds cool. I can't wait to see uh, some of that, and hopefully we can get some of that down at Craft Bread. So uh, thank you guys so much for making some time for us. Uh, I really appreciate it, and uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you, gentlemen, yeah, about you so what's much. going on. Are you all going to make it out to the event on the 19th? Apparently there's supposed to be a, a, a large crew coming out. Yeah, I, I, I want to make that one. And uh, also just wanted to invite everybody to the – our anniversary party on the 21st of April. So we that's used as a little warm up coming up yeah, right yeah. after that, man. So yeah, right after that's so the very next weekend. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so that'll be fun. I'll see you hopefully on the 19th and then probably on the 21st as well. All right. Very we'll grab cool. a couple of Swifties. All, All right. right. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you guys.